Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Monday, May the 10th for our intensive deep dive into the world of coach houses, laneway houses, garden suites. And by the way, those all have their own unique meeting, which we're going to learn more about this evening as well. So glad you were able to join us. I'm here with our guests, Andy Tran and Daniel Hall, who are both experts at laneway housing. Um, they've been eating, sleeping, and breathing it for months, if not years now in some cases. So we're super fortunate to have you guys here with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's our pleasure to be here. Oh, we so appreciate it. So for thanks those for of you, me. sorry? Oh, thanks for having me, Elizabeth. Oh, we're so glad to have you. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Elizabeth Kelly. I am a real estate investor. I have been for about the last 15 years. Uh, I have a, a large portfolio of properties and between Kirkland Lake and, uh, and St. John, New Brunswick. I also do rent to owns. Um, pretty much most of the strategies over the years, I've had the good fortune to be able to learn and be able to adapt into my investment toolbox. I was an elite trainer for Rich Dad Canada for eight years, and I am an investment coach. And my belief is that I would not be here where I am um, have been able to leave my job, retire my husband from his job, if there hadn't been people who helped me along the way. So that's my goal with these webinars is to bring people some great content, some great information, and hopefully to support and help you grow your portfolio on your journey, whether it's to being able to retire early or just to supplement your income and be able to take some really amazing vacations and spend more time with your family. This evening, as I mentioned, we have the amazing fortune to have Daniel Hall join us. Daniel is the founding principal of the Architect Builders Collaborative. So great organization, particular focus on green design, which um, unfortunately we're not hearing as much these days as I would like to be hearing, but Daniel is absolutely a specialist in green design, uh, formerly a licensed carpenter and now an architect and doing some pretty amazing, incredible things. Um, Daniel, I'll let you perhaps expand a little bit on all the juicy projects you're working on and uh, all the cool stuff that's going on um, in your world right now when you come on. And we also have Andy Tran joining us as investors. Most of you probably have a pretty good idea who Andy is. We see him around lots and we know Andy was, you know, one of the Southern Ontario, the, the big names, the specialists in teaching us how to put in basement apartments. And now as we're heading into this new world of coach houses, laneway houses, garden suites, uh, Andy, again, is uh, someone we can trust and we can go to for assistance as we're heading in those directions. So um, Andy's company is called Sweet Additions, and Andy is a registered house and small buildings designer, a real estate investor, and a developer. And you also hold a degree in architectural science. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. We really appreciate having you here. Now we're going to start this evening with Daniel, just so that everybody knows the format for this particular webinar. So what we're going to do is Daniel's going to have 30 minutes and he's going to show us sort of the, the ropes. What terminology do we need to know? Uh, what knowledge about, you know, how things work do we need to have? So Daniel's really going to show us the basics and, and what we need to know. And then Andy's going to say, from an investor's perspective, you know, which markets are utilizing these strategies? Where are the best or what types of properties are the best? What do the numbers look like? Daniel's going to share some numbers with us too, which is awesome. So a couple of different perspectives this evening, but I'm really hoping everybody's going to walk away with a sense of, you know, do I have a property in my portfolio that's not performing correctly, at, or not correctly, but it's not um, optimized or, or maximized for highest and best use? And can, is this a strategy that I can implement? Alternatively, so many people have left Toronto both, you know, to invest and to live. So is this an opportunity for us, you know, as people who might want to buy in Toronto, is there an opportunity to create some cash flow and some good income? So thank you again, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, oh, couple of little housekeeping items. So chat box, feel free guys, chat away in the chat box. Love to see discussion and participation and, you know, feedback provided to the presenters. Um, just so you know, the chat box, we are going to use it just for chatting. So if you guys don't mind, if you look at your chat box on the bottom right hand side, there's a little drop down and it's going to default when you come into all panelists. 
And if you click on the drop down, it will say panelists and attendees. So if you just want to chat with the panelists, then leave it the way it was when you came in. But most people want to be able to chat with the attendees and sort of share insights and information, those kinds of things. So by all means, click it to the drop down that says all panelists and attendees. The other thing, we're going to keep the Q&A box. We're going to try and keep that for specific questions that pertain to the material that we're covering. And that really helps me with being able to moderate in terms of making sure that people's questions don't get lost somewhere in the chat box before we reach a point in time where the speakers have a chance to answer it. So chat, discussion, whatever in the chat box, that's awesome. And for specific questions that pertain to tonight's material, pop into the Q&A. So, Daniel's gonna spend about 30, minute, 30 minutes sharing his information with us. Then we're gonna have Andy, who will come and do his 30 minutes. And then the last 30 minutes this evening are gonna be dedicated to answering your questions. So if you have some questions, don't forget to put them in the Q&A box. All right, Daniel, I think we're good to go over to you. And uh, I will keep an eye on the Q&A on the chat box for you. And um, we'll take it from there. All right, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I'm uh, very glad to be here. Um, always happy to share information about laneway suites, garden suites, as you say, coach houses, granny flats. Um, it's an area of huge interest to the work in our firm. It's a small part of what we do, but a big interest in it. And I'll just uh, give you a little bit of an intro to myself. I am, as you said, formerly a licensed carpenter back from the early 80s and been an architect since 2004, and long had an interest in what you can do in small spaces. So that project on the upper left is a project called the Mini Home. I guess we should have thought of Tiny Home and trademarked that, but that was 2006. We debuted a portable, off-grid, eco-friendly, factory-built house, CSA certified, so it meets the building code for permits. Uh, we had that at the National Home Show in 2006. And that, I show that because that outwardly is 354 square feet. We have two queen size beds and a, bath, a full bath with a tub and shower in it. So it shows what you can do in a small footprint and garden suites, laneway houses are bigger than that. Although in some markets you're limited to about 550 square feet, but it still shows the potential of what you can do if you think creatively about how you use your space. So for the last uh, 12 years now, I've been part of the Architect Builders Collaborative. And no, we're not design builders. We get asked that all the time, probably an unfortunate choice of the name. The emphasis is on the collaboration part. We play well in the sandbox. We like to work with builders that we know, with ones we don't know. And really with the feeling that if you wanna get good green buildings, you have to have this really close connection with the designers and the builders, and you have to be able to work well together and avoid this kind of what's traditionally often a conflict um, based relationship, arguing about what's in a contract and what isn't. So our emphasis is very much on working together. Uh, that's our office, some of our senior staff pictured there. This is our office these days, like most of you who aren't working in the office right now. Uh, some of our staff there on one of our regular get togethers on Zoom to keep everyone uh, in the loop together. That was actually uh, yesterday, that shot. Uh, laneway housing, why do we even care, and garden suites. Some of you will be familiar with the term the yellow belt. You all heard of the green belt, right? That's the area around the city that's more or less off limits to development. It keeps our ecosystems in balance. As a result, most of the intense development happens within that green belt. We have something like 100,000 people a year moving into, the, into Toronto. We need to house them all. So the yellow is from the official plan. You know, some wags said green belt, hey, let's do yellow belt. There's a karate thing there going on, I guess. And the yellow belt is this area of yellow on the official plan map of the city of Toronto that are what are called neighborhoods. That's the terminology. I mean, it's not a fancy word, but in the plan, the term neighborhood means don't develop here. <laughs> it's a big yellow flag to developers. Neighborhood to develop in a neighborhood needs an official plan amendment usually, which is a really onerous process. It makes rezoning look like a cakewalk. So as a result, these neighborhoods don't change very much. And that's led to this sort of stagnated development of what you've heard the phrase, the missing middle. And that's, you know, the houses on one end of that on the far left, mid-rise, 12-story, 14-story buildings on the right. The missing middle is the area of interest, I suspect, to most of us here tonight, sort of that smaller scale investment properties. 
So a lot of cities have this, you know, they have six story buildings, walk ups. Um, some of the great cities in Europe have this kind of buildings. Uh, here, we're lucky if we get a triplex. Maybe, you know, uh, you know, someone slipped a six unit apartment in somehow somewhere in the past before the zoning said you can't do it. So this is the area we're interested in. How do we make more of this? And the city has finally got on board with this. They're expanding housing opportunities in neighborhoods, E-H-O-N for short. There's a whole suite of programs and Laneway Suites is one of them. Garden Suites is another. Pilot Project for Missing Middle Development is another one. There's a pilot project underway in Beaches East York now. So they are looking at more of this kind of development. And Laneway Housing and Garden Suites are maybe the missing little. They're at the far left of the spectrum, but they have the potential to basically double up on the density in a lot of these neighborhoods, one building at a time with small capital investment. You don't need to buy a block and put in $100 million to do this. So it will change a lot. A little bit on terminology, laneway suite, uh, laneway housing, laneway suite, they mean the same thing to all of us. The city of Toronto uses the term laneway suite. Some jurisdictions use the term accessory dwelling unit. Some use um, ancillary dwelling unit, uh, ADU, you'll hear that in the States a lot. Garden suites, coach houses, granny flats, they are all forms of a house behind a house. And those of you who've been in this game for a while will know that until a few years ago, if you tried to propose a house behind a house and you got in front of committee of adjustment, literally they'd say, that looks like a house behind a house to me. Is that a motion to deny? Yep, Andy, that's a motion to deny. And they'd vote it down. And I've been at numerous hearings like that. So in Toronto, this shifted in 2018. Province-wide, I believe it was 2019. It's the, um, what are they called? More Choices, More Home Choices for Homes. I can't remember the correct name of the act. Bill 108. That has basically required municipalities across the province to do something on this front. So recently we've seen Kitchener just passed a bylaw a few weeks ago. Guelph did a number of weeks before that. Hamilton did a while back. Uh, Ottawa a couple of years ago. Uh, Toronto is looking at garden suites coming in sometime in third quarter, fourth quarter of this year. There will be laws in place around that. The main thing, and I know Andy's going to go into more detail on this, the main thing is that they're smaller than the main house. They're subordinate in scale. Beyond that, the rules do vary as what's allowed. And they're on the same property, and they're generally not severable. We always get asked that question. City of Toronto is super clear. These properties are not to be severed and sold off separately. So they are really there to stimulate rental housing or for one's own family, multi-generational, things like that. So right now, what's allowed as of right, and I'll use that term in zoning language, as of right means you meet the zoning bylaw and we can walk in, well, email into the building department, your permit application, and we know we will get it approved. There may be some questions about structure or an engineering comment, but you have the right to do it. If a project is not as of right, that, that's when you end up going to the committee of adjustment for a minor variance in the as of right envelope. And first off, where? You know, so the laneway house bylaw in Toronto says if you have a laneway against your property, you're, you're in, in a way, you know, any of the R zones, not the uh, CR zoning, the commercial zoning. So, you know, Bathurst Street near Dundas, where it's CR, you have laneways behind it, but that's not an R zone. Go over one street onto Markham Street, same laneway, you're now in an R zone. So there's about 300 kilometers of these lanes and 49,000 plus properties in Toronto. Of those my hunch is no one's counted them properly, but I would say from what we see about 20 to 25% of those will pass through the sieve of all the rules. So that's still 10, 15,000 properties. And those are the little green lines there. Except this one tiny neighborhood, these people um, bordered by Bloor Street, Rosedale Valley Road, the CPR line and Avenue Road. They didn't want any part of this and they somehow had enough political clout that they got voted off the Laneway House Island here. So if your property's in that zone, thank your neighbors, but you're out of luck. Anywhere else you can build them. And really there's three basic tests we look at if we get asked to look at properties. So people will call us up, they'll book a call and we'll run them through this high level test without having to step foot on the property. Beyond that, we take a look. 
So the three basic ones, it seems obvious, are you on a laneway? But there are public laneway. There are lanes and things that look like lanes that are not legally lanes. So we have to check that 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 thing that you think is the lane behind or beside your property is actually public city of Toronto laneway and not private property or some form of right of way. If it is, you still might be eligible for a garden suite when those rules come in. So that's kind of like sit tight for six months and we'll really know what the rules are, but I'll fill you in what we know now tonight. So you need to be on a laneway and you need three and a half meters, 11 feet of property abutting the laneway. So there's lots of those, but when we talk about garden suites, there's about 420,000 properties in Toronto with houses, detached, semis, triplexes on them. We don't know how many will be eligible, but if you apply the same math, 20 or 25%, you can see this is about 50,000 properties. And the key from an investment perspective, if you're in the market for a property, is to know which, which 20%. So garden suites is the city's term, city of Toronto, different jurisdictions use different terms. This is for a laneway suite with no laneway. Um, if you go on Airbnb and you travel to Brooklyn and you find a garden suite there, it's not a laneway house, I'll tell you. It's their word for a basement apartment. They open onto the back garden from the brownstones. In Toronto, there are these little houses behind houses. The city has got public consultations starting tomorrow night, 6.30 tomorrow night. They've got one on the next day and Wednesday and one on Thursday evening. They do not have draft bylaws yet. If you go on these public consultations, and I will be on some of them to listen in, they are not, as far as we know, going to be presenting the proposed rules yet. Um, how do we know this? Because we're presenting to the city planners on Thursday uh, some research we're doing on how green you can make laneway suites and how much it will impact their carbon footprint and how much it will impact their cost of doing that. So we've got our ear pretty close to the ground with the planners working on this, so they're not quite ready to say where exactly they're going to allow these. Garden suites, again, I stress this is from the city website, intended to be non-severable. means they cannot be turned into a separate property from the main house. One of the ways they ensure that is they insist that all the utility connections be shared when they leave the property. I'm going to touch on that in a few minutes. So I said there were three tests. Test one, are you in public lane? Test number two, can you get emergency access? And if you're confused about the rules, you are not alone. Um, I think of them like traffic lights. Green light, if you have clear path of travel for the firefighters beside your house on your property or less than 45 meters up the lane. Yellow light, if you can share that access with your neighbor between two houses or more than 45 meters, but less than 90 meters up the laneway. Don't have those, it's a red light. If you do not have 900 millimeter wide, 2100 millimeter, so that's three feet by seven foot, clear path of travel from the fire truck to the door of your laneway suite that is no more than 90 meters up a lane or 45 meters through a clear path of travel by your house, Toronto Fire is going to say no. Now, this is not as of right as I talked about in the zoning bylaws. This is not in the zoning bylaw. It's frankly not even in the building code. This is made up in Toronto, Toronto Fire Department saying this is how we're going to interpret a section of the code that simply says you must take into account access for firefighters, their equipment, turning radiuses, things like this. As a building code consultant pointed out quite successfully at a building code commission hearing uh, last year, if you applied these rules for Toronto, anywhere else in the province, there wouldn't be a single cottage or rural farm property that you would be allowed to be built because nobody is that close to a fire, to the road or the fire hydrant. However, these are the rules and this is the ones we have to play within. So we'll take a quick look at what this means. The green light, 900 millimeters or 36 inches clear space on your property, unobstructed, except you're allowed hydrometers and gas meters and what they call other local protrusions. Now we are going to find out for one of our clients if a chimney breast will now be qualified as a local protrusion. In the past, it has been a no. If you have a chimney breast poking out and it restricts you to less than 36 inches, you cannot get through there with the firefighter. So that's one thing we check. Surveys are really good for checking this to know where your lot line is. So there's a little map which show what happens on these properties on the right. Only the one in blue would meet that test. Well, none of the rest do. But we can extend this rule and go up the laneway to 45 meters. So the fire truck, to be clear, will not drive up the laneway. I mean, they might in a real fire, but they're not going to promise to. 
So they have to have a place to park on a public street that's within 45 meters of a fire hydrant, and then they measure another 45 from the truck. If they can reach your property, then you're good. So yellow light, say you have this, you have five feet between your house, yours and your neighbors, very common situation in Toronto. Neither one of you has three feet. What do you do? Well, if your neighbor is cooperative, you sign what's called a limiting distance agreement with the neighbor. The city has a process on their website. They've got standard forms. You still need to get lawyers involved. You need surveys. Budget yourself about $5,000 for this process. And the city solicitor gets a copy, proof of registration on title. And essentially, you've just created a right of way for each other in the favor of your neighbor on your property, in your favor over your neighbors, just like a shared mutual driveway. And for most people who have this situation, they use the house like that already. So it's not necessarily a big ask of your neighbor to say, will you put in writing what we've been doing all along, which is taking our garbage bins up and down there and our bicycles and going into the backyard. So if you do that, you both get the ability to build a laneway suite. Or up the laneway, more than 45 meters, but less than 90. This was codified in December and actually formalized, I guess, in January in a memorandum of understanding from the fire department. They'll let you do it, but they're gonna make a few extra rules. You have to make your building more fire safe. So you have to engage a professional engineer and they have to design a fire alarm system, not simply smoke detectors as you put in the house, but an engineered system. And it has to include a strobe light, something like this on the outside wall of the laneway suite. So the firefighters can figure out where the fire is when they come running up the lane. And then you have two choices. Option one is you spring for, hey, bad joke, I guess, spring for a sprinkler system cost you about $25,000, a residential grade sprinkler system. Cistern pump uses your existing water line. If you don't want to do that, you can make more fire safe walls and particularly on laneway suites. This means the wall that faces the lane and the one that faces your house. The other two already have to be fire rated anyways. These walls have to be fire rated and we're going to end up with fewer windows on them essentially. So this really becomes a design decision. You know, what can we design? Do you like it enough? with the smaller windows and fire safe walls, or do you wanna spend the money on a sprinkler? This probably depends if it's a rental property or it's for yourself. If it's an income property, we will find a way to bring good light and air in there with smaller windows. You know, don't spend the 25,000. So that's what happens when you do that. All of these properties now become eligible. And then as I said, the red light, you just can't do it. You don't have the space or you're too far up the laneway. So these are the sort of the three key tests. The third one is trees. We love trees in Toronto. We protect them with a private tree bylaw. Not too many jurisdictions do that. So not just city trees, but private trees. So you're, what, what is your tree in your backyard? You cannot cut it down or cause serious injury to it if it's larger than a foot or 30 centimeters in diameter measured at around chest height. Then it's protected and you'll see things like these orange snow fences or more properly constructed plywood hoardings around trees to define what is called a tree protection zone. That's an area you're not supposed to crush the roots, but it's also an area therefore where we can't build foundations and we're not supposed to build on top of it. So any tree within 20 feet or six meters of your property, urban forestry needs to know about it and they have the final say as whether or not they're gonna let you build. So we need to be mindful of that. Again, not in the zoning bylaw, not even in the building code. This is Toronto Municipal Code tree bylaw. Now we can work with trees. This is a 150 year old oak tree in East York. We've got the thumbs up from urban forestry to build, to take that garage, cut a corner out and put a second story on it and build a two story L-shaped building wrapping around this tree. The other photo in the backyard, you can see a garage overgrown with vines built right beside an existing huge maple. We've got permission from urban forestry to tear that garage down and replace it with a two story laneway house as well. That one went to committee um, about 16 neighbors signed a petition opposing it because they were concerned about the tree. Uh, the first thing we did before we even went to committee, the very first thing we did when we looked at this and assessed this property is we hired an arborist to come in and look at the tree. And we talked with our structural engineer and we came up with a system that allows us to build near the tree and we designed to stay away from it. Uh, they're building a basement, but we're not building it right by the tree roots. So it is possible, it takes more work and also more money and more patience. So the three tests, just to recap, do you have fire access? Are you on a public lane? And do you have any trees in the way? 
If you clear all of those, we know you will be allowed to build. So it becomes what you can build. And I said, these are smaller than main houses, but they are bigger in Toronto than anything I've seen in any other jurisdiction. And Andy might be able to follow up on this. Toronto allows a full two-story height, six meters, two stories. They do have a zone you have to stay out of from the main house. This is really important. Four two-story buildings, seven and a half meters away or 25 feet from the main house to the laneway suite. Now, so pause and say, I am blitzing through this because I normally take an hour and 15 minutes to do most of this presentation and Andy's seen it. So I've edited it down. I should tell you, and I think Elizabeth knows this, there's a guide to laneway housing that we provided Elizabeth to send to all of you who attend that has all of this in it. So if I'm going too fast, get a hold of the guide, <laughs> read it at your leisure. So there's this zone. You'd be forgiven for thinking that every laneway house in Toronto has to have a 45 degree angular plane on the back of it, because that's mostly what you see. It's not actually true. Uh, we've built them without it. What is true is that if you are only seven and a half meters from the main house, then for the next two meters, there is this angular plane, which is like a keep out zone. You're not supposed to build there, except you can build a dormer. So that's what you see there. Under construction, a dormer that occupies no more than 30% of the width of the house is going up into that angular plane zone. So you can build, it just restricts exactly what there. Then we have a maximum depth, no matter how deep your lot is, of 10 meters, 32 foot nine. And you have to be set back from the laneway, one and a half meters or five feet. This is partly to give enough separation distance from window to window. If your neighbors across the other side of the lane, you don't wanna to be too close. So this is a pretty firm requirement. We have got an exemption at committee for this where an existing building was already closer to the lane, but if it's new, they're gonna to wanna to see this setback. And you can go up to eight meters wide, 26 foot three, 26 foot three wide. If your lot is more than eight meters wide, you can still build tight to a lot line, but you can only build the eight meter width. So that's 26 foot three by 32 foot nine, eight meters by 10 meters, 80 square meter footprint times two stories. That's 160 square meters. That's 1,720 square feet of house. Remember the 350 square foot mini home I showed you. This is like almost five times that size. So these are not small. This is a lot of house that you can build. So there's a couple of other rules to say. If you don't wanna build two stories, one story house, four meters high is deemed to be one story. Why would you do that? Well, maybe you want something that's barrier free and accessible, or maybe your lot is smaller because when you build one story, you have the same width, the same depth and setback from the lane, but what changes is you only have to be five meters or about 15 feet, 16 feet away from the main house. So if your lot is, your backyard is short, you may not be able to make a two story building financially viable, but a one story has a bigger footprint. And then here's the interesting part. The bylaws are completely silent about basements, meaning you are allowed to put a basement in. So you can stick a basement underneath this one story building. Now it's gonna cost you a bit of money to do it, particularly if there's a garage right next to you and you have to do some fancy shoring or benching like you see here in this picture, but you can do it. And you put the basement underneath, lift your ground floor up, because remember you've got four meters of height. So let go up three feet like most Toronto homes, tuck some basement windows underneath and you have a two-story building again inside a one-story envelope within a one-story footprint distance from the house. So it will cost you some money and depending on soil conditions, this particular project was a labor of love. The homeowners are moving in here and then able to rent out their house. They really wanted the basement. Um, Garrison Creek practically runs through their property. So this was no small feat to put a basement in here, but it can be done. Going up on the roof, uh, green roof, City loves them, particularly if you can't meet your soft landscaping requirements, which I'll touch on in the backyard. Solar panels are great. If you wanna do net zero homes, um, you can put mechanical equipment, lots of things on the roof, access panels, but not a deck. Okay, we get asked this all the time. You can put your green roof there and you can put a hatch or an access panel to get to the green roof. So in theory, you could go up and garden, but you can't but a rail on the roof are not allowed. Decks are allowed on the second floor level. They're allowed on the ground level. On the second floor level, they count as part of that footprint, that 10 meter by eight meter or whatever size constraints you're under. 
the deck is part of it. So you make a choice between outside deck space or inside living space. Um, your choice to make, but I would say because we do you know, a fair bit of work of design of not just these, we design multi-unit, we've designed you know, triplexes, single family homes. In the rental market, what we notice is people want features and bedrooms and decks are a big feature. And I would say most of my staff are probably your ideal rental tenant. They are young professionals. <laughs> and you know they tell me they want the deck and the outdoor space. So we really encourage you to think about the quality of the space you're making if you want to secure a good long-term tenant in it. A couple of other minor rules. Uh, your maximum footprint can only be 30% of the lot area. We've not yet seen that be a problem. And you have to be smaller than your main house. Technically, you can creep slightly bigger because of the way they measure square footage, but basically you have a 1,500 square foot main house, think 1,500 square foot laneway suite. Even if you had the lot, that would allow you to put a 1,700 square foot one on it. So maybe you need to plan an addition to the main house at the same time as building the laneway suite, then they both can get bigger. That's how our bylaws work. Parking, anyone who deals with multi-unit investment properties knows all about parking. You have a single family home, you need one spot. You add your secondary suite, you get a free pass and you still need one. You put in two secondary suites or you have a triplex, you need two. You have a quad, you need three. You have a quad and you add a laneway suite on the back. Do you need three, four, two? Zero. Zero spots as soon as you build the laneway suite for everything on the property. Even a six unit apartment building, zero parking spots required. However, you're not going to get a free pass on parking on the street. You are treated as though you have off-street parking in terms of priority for street parking permits. You do need to provide two bicycle parking spots on the property, in the house, outside of the house, in the backyard, up against the lane. Well, I wouldn't do that because they'll get stolen pretty quickly, but somewhere you need spots for two bikes on your property. Um, I personally love this. I cycle everywhere I can. It's the first time at this scale of housing that the city's required bicycle parking. Soft landscaping, this is the big one. This is what, in spite of this whole bylaw aimed to produce as of right situation, we are seeing two thirds of the projects that have been applied for going through committee of adjustment, two thirds. So what happened to the as of right? Well, I'm willing to bet I haven't analyzed them, but the few I've either listened in on or that we've run ourselves, it's soft landscaping. So the bylaws already require landscaping. You may know your backyard typically has to be 50% soft landscaping but there is no landscaping police that runs around and checks it. So you'll see lots of paved over backyards. However, the bylaw says 50% for a regular situation. For a laneway house, depending on the width of your lot, it's either 60% or 85% of the yard that's left between your house and the laneway house. 60 or 85%. 60 is manageable, 85 is almost impossible. We just finished a two story, 1600 square foot laneway house well spaced back from the house behind. And by the time we left the basement walkout from the main house that was there already and the set of steps off the first floor and we took out everything else out of the backyard and we measured it. And I told the owner, I said, I'm gonna buy you 16 one by one pavers, 16 of those one foot by one pavers. That's the amount of hard landscaping you're allowed. Knock yourself out, put them wherever you want. Said nothing else can go down there if you wanna close your permit. So. This is one that's tripping people up. And there's a little provision that that space between the laneway and the laneway suite has to be 75% soft landscaping, although there's an exemption for a permitted driveway. So if you're parking your car in the laneway suite, you don't have to put grass everywhere, but you have to put some, you can't just pave it. What does soft landscaping mean? Well, that's interesting. The bylaw has one of these beautiful bureaucratic definitions that soft landscaping is landscaping that is not hard. Don't you love it? So. It does not mean this, unfortunately. Oriole Landscaping, I'm gonna give a shout out to Oriole, great guys, we work with them a lot, do beautiful outdoor yards in the city of Toronto. They're great outdoor rooms, they're great at this stuff. I mean, they do, they're great landscapers. If this is your thing or this is what you have, you're gonna to have to go to committee for a minor variance to keep this because this is not soft and it's not 85% soft. It's really nice though. So what do we do? Well, this is that uh, project I showed you, the photo of the tree and the vine covered garage. This is their site plan and they have an existing deck you'll see in the left, 31 square meters. We did not have 85% soft landscaping. We got approval at Committee of Adjustment because we said, there's the deck. We wanna keep that deck, 
but we're prepared to put that. Well, I'm not sure it's going to look quite like that, but we're prepared to put a green roof on the laneway suite. The city planner said, yes, please. They endorsed us and they said to committee, their language is they never say they support something. But they say, if committee decides to vote for this, we'd like to see the green roof on it, which is their way of saying we're okay with it. So in spite of all the community objection from neighbors who literally just said, we like laneway housing, just not in our lane. They literally said that at the hearing. In spite of that, we got them approval and the green roof was a big part of it. So we sometimes pause and quiz people here. We're not gonna do that to you. Six images here, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Three of these meet all the bylaws and three don't. And I may just leave you guessing, but I'll tell you the ones that haven't been built yet are the ones that meet the bylaw. <laughs> Um, we got to talk a little bit about get in the mud and talk about the how, because this is important with what you can do. Uh, services, you have to put services, we mean water, sewer, hydro, maybe gas, uh, in for your laneway suite. And this is part of that comment about not being able to sever the property. The city insists that the services be shared, only one sewer connection, one water main connection at the street. Hydro will only bring in one set of overhead wires typically and Enbridge same, they only wanna bring one gas line in. No matter what you think you have in the laneway, I'll almost guarantee you your services are in the street. 95% of the time they are. There are things that look like sewers, they're not. They're storm sewers, there are wires that look like power lines, they're typically not. They're a street light power and they are telephone and cable internet lines. So if you have room like this to run beside the house, that's perfect. Dig up the space beside your house. Persuade your neighbor to let you dig it up, whatever it takes, it will be easier for you. Otherwise, we've got to bring them in from the main house. So electricity, you can do this like you've done if you've got multi-units, add an extra meter base, run a power line along the side of the house and bury it underground and have a load panel in the laneway suite. 200 amp service, please. We'll get into more of that later, but think about laneway suites as all electric. Do yourself a favor. The building code is going that way anyways. Fossil fuel heating is going to be outlawed by 2030 in the national model building codes. Do yourself a favor, think electric now. We can talk about how you can make that affordable, but skip the gas meter, put an electric meter in, give your tenant their own bill, and they are gonna take care of their energy conservation. You won't have to worry about it. Water, one water meter. Toronto meters are water, and we typically put them in the front wall of the basement, wherever the water meter comes up into the house. After that water meter, you can split off anywhere you want, but we recommend you do it right after the water meter so you reduce the chance of pressure problems when someone flushes the toilet in the laneway suite, you don't scald the person who's having a shower in the house. Again, run through the basement or outside down a trench, underground, four feet deep, please. Three quarter inch line we recommend, four feet deep for frost protection. That's what that looks like. There's a trench, someone taking a photo to send me, showing me that their blue water line is indeed four feet deep. Sewer goes the other way. That's what an insulated sewer line looks like in a trench as well, winding its way around a tree and off down the side of the house. This wasn't four feet deep because it's got a slope. It's got to run downhill. So we put insulation over it so that we don't freeze it up. If you can't do that, we put an ejector pump in. Cost a little bit more money. Um, these are like uh, sump pumps on steroids. They're sealed and they can lift sewage up to about 30 feet up in the air vertically. So for every problem, there is a solution. Plan ahead though. If you're thinking of taking the house you have and underpinning it, plan for your laneway suite when you do it, because that's the time to put in your water and sewer service. If you're thinking of building an addition on your house and you're gonna have a laneway house beside it, do yourself a favor and build the addition first, because it's gonna be a lot easier to do it before the laneway house blocks all your access to the laneway. So you wanna think about these things, plan ahead, even if you're planning for five or 10 years out, do your planning now, rough in the services now, if you're lowering the basement to put an apartment in. Plan for that laneway suite, plan for the garden suite, even if we don't know if you can do it yet. This is new. Um, Andy might want to comment on this. Uh, the HCRA, the Home Construction Regulatory Authority, formerly known as Tarion, although Tarion still lives on in the form of the warranty and the insurance body. If you've ever bought a condo or a new home, you got a Tarion warranty with it. This is your guarantee if there are problems with the builder. Laneway houses are considered new homes and Tarion has been replaced for the, the body that oversees the builders has been replaced with this new agency and right on their website, absolutely clear in black and white, they say that Tarion warranties and the HRCA, HCRA regulation applies to builders and vendors of laneway houses and garden suites across Ontario. 
So if you're in the business of selling someone a garden sweet turnkey, you have to give them a tear-down warranty. If you are hiring someone, someone's offering to build you one, ask for their registration. Up to now, the City of Toronto has not been enforcing this. There's a box on the permit application where you're supposed to put the registration number in. They've been ignoring it. I've seen it. We've built laneway houses with builders who are not carry on register. But I don't think that's going to go on for long now that the HCRA came into existence in February 1st. So only a few months in, I think they are going to start enforcing the rules. So you're talking to builders, or if you are a builder, get your paperwork in order. It is a bit of a headache. Uh, but get to that registration. If you're the purchaser, it is your insurance. They're backed by, you need to put down a $200,000 security to get HCRA registered. There's a guarantee that the builder is going to show up and fix the problems. So something to watch for, not a, not, not a lot of people are aware of this and it has not been strictly enforced to date, at least not in Toronto. I don't know about Ottawa, Hamilton and the like. So I'm going to briefly run through this and then turn this over to Andy. What does this look like? Well, these are three of our ready to build models. So if you're in the market to say, I just want something that looks great, performs great and is green, we can sell you ready to build plans. Our plans fully permit ready start at $9,500. And we've targeted, um, Andy's probably rolling his eyes because I know he, he can do that for less, but this is when you work with an architect. Um, the designs we do, to put it in context for you, if you approach us for a custom design for your like forever home, laneway home, expect to spend twenty-five to forty thousand dollars on design and engineering fees. So ninety-five hundred, we can get you rolling with the design, the bungalow, classic coach house. We got to change the name of the garden cottage now that garden suites are around. Uh, the bungalow is a one-story, fully accessible. Give us an eighteen-foot or wider lot, we can give you a fully accessible AODA compliant home for aging in place. Yourself, your parents, whoever you want. We can we design all of these ready to build ones for a 30 foot depth, so slightly smaller than the maximum depth. We can stretch them, of course, and we go up in steps of like 18 foot, 20, 22 foot wide lot widths. If you want the classic, you want to keep a parking spot. A lot of homeowners are interested in this. Keep the parking. It has a value, we're told, of at least $100,000 on your resale price of your property. So there might be good reason to keep parking. Uh, we can put an apartment on top, 16 foot and up, we can do one bedroom apartments, 20 foot and up lots, we can do two bedroom apartments. Go the whole hog with housing. This is when you're trying to go for that 16, 1700 square foot. So there are a variety of floor plans. Two bedroom needs a 16 foot, three bedroom with 20 foot. We recently did a three bedroom on a 24 foot wide property. That's a 1600 square foot home, three huge huge equally sized bedrooms targeting three young professionals sharing a house as opposed to a family with sort of, you know, smaller room for kids and big open concept living. So that's a little bit taste. We can do custom design. Now this one's almost built. The photo I showed you on the uh, dormer is the back side of this building going up. So this is the forever home for the homeowners who are now turning their house over to their kids, well, daughter, son-in-law and grandchild to live in their main house. And mom lives in part of the main house as well. So four generations on the property. That's it for me. I probably ran over time. My apologies to you, Andy. Um, contact information, and I'm sure Elizabeth will share that. And I will turn this over to Andy now. Daniel, I'm super impressed. You did so well to condense your, your presentation down. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Such great information, I learned a ton. There's, um, there's a bunch of questions for you, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna wait until the end and spend whatever time we have left when Andy's done uh, going through the questions and then people can choose to stay if they want, but we will have covered the, the main content. So um, you guys are doing a great job. I see there's four questions waiting in the Q&A tab and uh, we'll let Andy take over now and tell us what all this awesome information means for us as investors, both in Toronto and in some of the other markets as well. Awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Daniel. That's, uh, that was great information, Daniel. Uh, exactly the type of information I was looking for coming into tonight. So appreciate that. Uh, can uh, everybody see my screen here? Uh, we can see you're good, Andy. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So I will quickly uh, run through kind of my background here. Uh, so my focus is a little bit more general in terms of Ontario because uh, the garden suites policy is meant to address the, the policies province-wide. 
Um, I'm going to go at it a little bit from the investment side of things. For a lot of the uh, small investors, uh, I'm sure that's part of your audience, uh, myself included, and uh, perhaps some homeowners as well. So my background is uh, as a house designer focusing mostly on second suites, primarily basement apartments. Um, so I've done a bunch of that for my own portfolio and for probably close to 250 uh, investor and homeowner clients for the past five years or so. Um, outside of that, I've also been involved with small scale infill development. So taking a lot, a corner lot, severing it, uh, building a semi-detached home with purpose-built second suites. So it's kind of like, um, you know, on, on a very small scale with the, with, the, um, with the second suites and then slightly larger would be the infill development. I find that the garden suites is in that Goldilocks zone right between. So if you kind of want to uh, build something, whether it's a laneway suite or a garden suite, but maybe not necessarily want to go through the, the entire approval process for uh, a severance. I think a laneway suite or a garden suite is going to be the perfect zone for that. And uh, with, the, uh, with the bylaws that are going to make them buy right in municipalities across the province, it's very exciting. So uh, Bill 108 is the uh, provincial um, act that uh, got passed in 2019. And uh, basically what this states is that you are allowed to have, um, they are authorizing two residential units in a house. So that's your standard single family with a accessory suite or basement apartment. And then by authorizing a residential unit in a building uh, or structure that is ancillary to the house. So that's gonna be detached, right? So un up until now, we've only had uh, Toronto and Hamilton having laneway houses. We've had coach houses in Ottawa for several years, but my understanding is that that hasn't taken, um, uh, there hasn't been much traction on, traction on it just because that eliminates your ability to put in that second unit. So it didn't make sense for a lot of people. But I think this garden suite policy pr province-wide being it allowed as a third unit, that is definitely a game changer. So here's a little diagram that I did, which really just outlines uh, the benefits of garden suites and by extension lane weight suites as well. And this is kind of uh, not really looking at it from an investment perspective, but people who want to be able to resolve certain issues, uh, you know, for their family structure and living arrangement and just financial feasibility, uh, small homeowners who want to be able to take advantage of land that they already own to gain some, some income, right? So we have this first example here perhaps a, a young family uh, on, on the main house, and then you have a, an ADU or a garden suite where you may be renting it to a smaller family. family. Um, Daniel did mention earlier that there was a family where uh, they moved out of the main house and then their family moved into the main house and then they were able to have a multi-generational living arrangement. Okay, so that's kind of these two. Um, but the way I had it here is that one is a tenant and you can certainly tenant out your main house as well. Right? You have empty nesters that are still very active and may not necessarily want to uh, you know, move out of their main house, but you know, that extra income is gonna be very beneficial. Right? So these are just uh, a few of the arrangements that we see as uh, something that's common in markets where these have proliferated mostly on the west coast of the country as well as uh, you know, on, the, on the western uh, North Pacific Northwest of the United States. So what's the key here from a dollars and cents perspective? Um, as someone who is involved in small scale development, I can tell you that, um, you know, having land that uh, you own and can sever, it's not as free as you think, right? A lot of people says, you know, I'm going to sever this and I'm going to be, be able to build a house. But uh, if you've been through that process, you'll realize that there are so many costs associated with such small scale development. And that is in the form of various uh, approvals, development fees, uh, consultant fees, and um, just a lot of little things that are going to potentially even add, you know, $75,000 towards your project before you can even put a shovel to the ground. And I'm sure Daniel's fully aware of that. And so with, with garden suites, uh, the big thing is that really your land cost is zero. Um, the, the mandate from the province really is to uh, reduce the overhead and the red tape in order for homeowners and small investors to be able to be become developers essentially, right? Um, trying to eliminate a lot of the development fees. A lot of cities will have registration fees and things like that, but they're very nominal. So they're not, you know, they may be in the hundreds or, you know, low thousands, but not in the tens of thousands for, for fees. 
So that's kind of the big change that essentially makes it quote unquote free land that you're building on. So here's a couple of uh, really quick and dirty sample pro formas that I put together. Um, and the one on the left is really what has worked for many homeowners and investors in the past several years. And it still works because, you know, we're still very busy with secondary suites and it's, you know, buying a single family home, you know, perhaps not in a market like Toronto, but uh, a lot of the cities, uh, you know, for, for a lot of the, the folks that are in investing, right? So the Hamilton, the Berries, Kitchener's, and, and now, uh, you know, even to some of the other cities that, because, you know, it's very expensive, even in those cities that I've mentioned, right? So now you're looking at places like Welland, St. Catharines, Brantford, you know, looking at the price at probably at around the half million dollar mark, putting in here, uh, putting in a second suite. By the way, these numbers are prior to the crazy run up in prices of lumber. So uh, <laughs> you might be uh, uh, chuckling a little bit looking at these numbers, but you know, we'll just keep it like this for now. And uh, very, very quick and dirty, uh, investment required on a down payment and uh, uh, renovation costs for a second suite. Um, I didn't put closing costs here, again, just very high level. You know, you're looking at 3,000, 3,500 in rental income, your main unit maybe 1,700, second unit maybe 13, 14, 1,500, mortgage and taxes on that. So you're looking at a few hundred dollars in cash flow, which is not bad, certainly makes a lot of sense where you can access your home equity line of credit, and essentially the rent that you're gonna get is gonna be paying off the interest portion. And in under 10 years, you'll be able to pay off the principal portion as well. And then after that, it just becomes a capital asset that keeps generating revenue. So now really what we're doing with option two with the garden suite is just adding in one further component, which is the garden suite, right? So um, again, these numbers may be based on, uh, you know, older lumber, <laughs> older lumber prices, but uh, a very basic garden suite, maybe slab on grade, uh, you know, not a basement, maybe not even a crawl space, right? Maybe something very simple, uh, two bedrooms, wood frame siding type of thing. So, you know, this is probably a number that a lot of investors can work with on something that may be 500 to 700 square feet. So all the other numbers are the same. The only thing is you were adding in a garden suite. And the assumption is that we're not going to be financing the construction because it is such a new product. Not a lot of lenders are on board, although I am speaking to several lenders where there may be an opportunity for construction financing if you can show them that, uh, you know, you can actually get, get it done. So if you uh, hire a designer or a contractor that can actually build these, uh, there may be lending options. But assuming you're going to have to pay cash to build this, uh, what you're looking at, obviously, with mortgage and taxes is going to be the same because you're, you're financing the garden suite. Your cash flow jumps uh, over three times, whereas your investment required is... Uh, slightly over 2x. And the reason for that is really because of that free land that I discussed, right? You have land that you already own where you can construct on. Uh, you don't have to, you know, purchase anything in addition. And this makes a lot of sense for people who, you know, may not necessarily want to be over leveraged on their property. They may be okay with having, uh, you know, quite a bit of equity in there and using some of the equity from you know, their principal residence or existing pro property that they've had in their portfolio for many years that have built that equity. And they may not necessarily want to go and leverage more on another property. Okay. They just want to utilize the existing land and be able to get that rent. Okay. So that's what we're seeing a lot of people are doing. Uh, what I want to go over right now are some of the important rules that are consistent among some of these municipalities that we're looking at. And I'll list a few of the cities uh, in a bit, but uh, I kind of want to show you these five items that are things that you're, you're definitely going to consider and want to find out the exact rules for the particular town or city that you're looking into, right? So the lot size is going to be very important. Um, there's going to be a minimum lot size in most municipalities. There's going to be unit size restrictions, and that is to ensure that you don't overbuild on the site for many reasons. Obviously, parking is always going to be an issue, especially in the lower density areas, the R1 zones, and then maximum height issues, right? So Daniel has already covered a lot of these items, uh, but we're going to look at it more generally across some of the cities and towns uh, in Ontario. And then also the connection of utilities as well. So here are just a couple of uh, sample designs that uh, you know our team has been playing with in the past several months, and you know we're having more of these types of renderings available, and hopefully 
we can start uh, you know, building these. Uh, we do have a couple of projects in the works right now. And the example that I'm using right now is to show you um, the rules based on Hamilton's proposed garden suite policy. So they call them SDUs. So we're just using them as an example and we're using one of my client's uh, properties where we've added in the second unit and we propose what it's gonna look like with a garden suite, right? So this is your typical R1 neighborhood. This is on the Hamilton mountain. Um, they don't call them R1 there, they call them C zones, but all intents and purposes, it is the same. Now understand that the province, the province's goal is to um, target these low density areas, right? So. Um, as Daniel mentioned, some of the, the yellow belt areas in Toronto, uh, some of the R1 neighborhoods, um, not necessarily the R2 or R3 density zones because those they're already kind of high density. So they're really trying to target uh, the really low density where there's actually a population decline in a lot of places. And, uh, you know, just because a lot of families, for example, can't even afford to get into these properties, um, you know, a lot of them are empty nesters who have owned their house for, house for many decades and you see population decline in in things like schools. So by adding in second suites and third suites and garden suites, they're trying to basically bring, uh, revitalize a lot of these neighborhoods. And it makes a lot of sense because you do have the infrastructure, the sewer systems, the utilities to be able to support that additional population, okay? So this is just us uh, superimposing this onto the, uh, the Google 3D map here. And lot size is the, uh, the first thing we talk about that we wanna consider. Um, so an example may be that they will give you just a strict arbitrary number, 4,000 square feet minimum or 5,000 square feet minimum. Usually it's gonna be a, a, in metric, right? Um, this is to ensure that you know, it's not gonna be overly in, in dense areas. And uh, this also uh, uh, tackles a lot of the, the R1 neighborhoods that I had uh, alluded to earlier. So in this particular example, you know, we have this uh, lot here that's roughly 62 by 120 feet. So we have a total lot area of 7,500 square feet. So that box gets checked and that's gonna be okay. I generally recommend if you can try to go for at least 5,000 square feet if possible um, in order for you to be able to create something that's gonna make sense. Um, I think that if you're going to be building a structure with a foundation, um, you know, costs are very high. Costs of construction are very high, right? Uh, you know, an electrical panel is going to cost the same whether the home is 1,500 square feet or whether it's 800 square feet. So the larger you can build, the better. Uh, that really brings the per square footage cost down. And um, so, you know, try to obviously try to get the larger lot, all things being equal. Um, so their initial proposal was 50 square meters. They've gotten a lot of pushback, myself included, that it is a little bit small. Um, you know, I will still be trying to make a two bedroom because I think that if you're going to be building a garden suite, it makes sense to have a two bedroom, right? A one bedroom unit really, you know, takes away a big chunk of the demographic that can live there, right? You can't have people who, you know, you can have single people and you can have people who are a couple, but what if they're two friends, uh, you know, siblings or parent and child, that sort of uh, dynamic where you're not going to be able to meet that with a single bedroom. And so they've gotten a lot of pushback and uh, I believe they've increased it to 775 square meters, which is roughly around 800 square feet. Uh, so that, you know, I would prefer to be more, but I think that's a, a good compromise for these uh, garden suites where it's really intended, uh, as, as Daniel mentioned earlier, to be subordinate to the main unit, okay? Um, a lot of them will have things like maximum 10% of lot area or, you know, a, a strict number like 600 square feet or 800 square feet Sometimes they will combine them uh, and say, whichever one's gonna be smaller is the one that's gonna supersede. And really this is just to over, uh, to mitigate overbuilding, right? Uh, you know, it can have effects on the neighbors. There can be shadow effects. There can be runoff issues. And really this maximum coverage is really just to kind of prevent overbuilding. And, you know, sometimes it may not be um, a ratio of just that unit. Maybe they'll combine it with a garage or all the buildings. So including the main house. It may be something like all the all the structures on the on the property cannot exceed forty percent of the lot area or fifty percent. Okay, so the important thing is you need to check your particular uh, municipality for that. So parking minimums. The Planning Act in the province is really pushing for tandem parking. Um, you know, tandem parking is not a great idea because it. Uh, you know, there's going to be obstructions. If there's going to be occupants that are living 
next to each other and they're unrelated, that causes a problem. Now, even though I'm saying it's not a good idea, I think that the cities should allow tandem parking because I think that this is one of the things that they should allow the homeowner to come up with solutions that work for them. So as an example, in Toronto, um, Daniel mentioned earlier that if you have a laneway house, you can potentially have three or four units on that property and the parking requirements are zero. However, a lot of these laneway houses still have two parking spaces or one parking space because from a market standpoint, it just makes a lot of sense to have that parking available. But it may not necessarily be the 2.8 meters by 6 meters that's required to, you know, park a Cadillac DeVille from the 1950s, right? The world has changed since then. And so um, even though I don't, I think that for homeowners and investors, think about having that parking availability because it provides you flexibility, right? As much as we all like to think that uh, Tesla or Uber is going to take over and we're, none of us is going to be <laughs> driving cars, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So have that uh, flexibility so that, you know, you can rent it out easier. Uh, and, 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 you know, if they don't need to park there, that's, that's even better, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, so maximum height, this is something that you're going to see in a, uh, a lot of bylaws across the various towns and cities. And a lot of them don't really, they're not very explicit about, you know, is it one story or two story? A lot of them will give you a number like three meters or six meters. That implicitly is going to tell you how high it's going to be. So for example, three meters, you know, that's going to be a single story, right? Six meters, you can probably try to do two stories. And the way it's usually calculated is that if you have a sloped roof, they're going to take the average, right? And that's going to be the height. Whereas if you have a flat roof, of course, it's going to be the, to the top of the flat roof. And, um, you know, so you can try to get creative here. And uh, one thing that I want to also point out is that um, sometimes a city, I'll give you an example. I was talking to the city of Welland. And they have a bylaw which says that you cannot have your lot area more than 10%, uh, your, excuse me, you cannot have the garden suite more than 10% of the lot area. But they don't care, uh, they say that the maximum height can be six feet. So they're not explicit about the basement, about a second story. So if you have six meters, I think I said six feet, no, not six feet, six meters. So if you're creative in your design, you can potentially have a basement and two stories, uh, which can, you know, really bring in the significant amount of square footage that you might need for, for that unit. So that's the fourth item, I think. And the last is utilities. And I definitely agree that we should uh, move over to electric. Um, this is something that's, uh, you know, that's where we're headed. Um, for the time being, uh, definitely the city aren't, isn't gonna want you to have a direct connection to the services. It's going to be through a Y connection or through the main house for plumbing and drains. Um, electrical most likely is going to be uh, uh, connected off of your, your main panel. So for a lot of the clients that I'm working with right now with second suites that are considering doing garden suites in the future, I say plan for it, right? Speak to your plumber. What's going to be the best arrangement to get uh, the needed services to this garden suite? So. You know, we know that if you have three bathrooms, which is going to be minimum if you have uh, a two unit house plus a garden suite, you're going to need a one inch service line, right? So prepare for that. If you have a old lead pipe or a half inch copper pipe or a galvanized steel pipe and you're going to upgrade, might, you might as well go to one inch. Why go to three quarters and have to potentially upgrade in the future? So think about that now when you are adding, uh, you know, even if you're not, you don't have any plans in the, in the near future is plan for that because the last thing you want to do is dig up anything on your $150,000 uh, second suite and main suite rental of the, of the main house, right? So it is, it must be connected to municipal services. You can't dig up a well for water. You can't use septic systems if you're in the urban boundary. Uh, if you're in the rural areas, that's a whole set of different rules. And, you know, this is not meant for that, but cities will have their own um, or, or counties, they will have their own rules for, for rural areas. So that is uh, kind of it in a nutshell in terms of the five items. Again, very high level, very general, just because every city is very unique. So some of the bylaws that are in place right now are places like Barry, Welland, Brantford. So um, I purchased a property recently in Brantford and uh, that's what we're gonna be doing. Uh, we're gonna be putting in a garden suite. Uh, we also have another property there 
uh, where we're going to be doing a severance. It's in an R2 zone. So we're going to try to get a zoning amendment to be able to put a garden suite. So effectively, what we're trying to do is turn one single family home into six units in total. Uh, that's going to be uh, not easy to do, but we're going to try. Uh, some of the other places are Guelph, uh, City of Kortha Lakes, uh, Windsor and uh, London, and I'm sure there's going to be a few other places that have uh, since changed uh, since I put this presentation together. Coming soon, very exciting, of course, some of the key cities that a lot of us are interested in, right? Um, so I'll just quickly cover that. So Hamilton uh, Council passed April 28th. There were some amendments and that is being ratified right now by council. And it looks like early June that we're gonna have bylaws in place. So uh, that's gonna be a big market, of course, for a lot of the folks uh, on the uh, audience tonight. So you can stay, you can stay up to date by going to the, uh, so they call them SDUs, secondary dwelling units, and that's gonna encompass basement apartments and garden suites. And if you just Google Engage Hamilton SDU or Residential Zoning Project, uh, that's where you can get stay up to date on that. So if there's a lot of good information on there. Uh, Kitchener Pass Council on April 19th. Um, they are, I think, just wrapping up their appeal process. You know, at the end of the day, everybody is going to have to comply. So even if there's any sort of appeal, you know, it's just a matter of time uh, that it's going to be uh, brought on board, right? So Kitchener is on board as well. Uh, and then Toronto, of course, public consultation, perfect timing. So tomorrow, maybe I'll see some of you there tomorrow evening. <laughs> uh, and if you haven't, please take the survey. So go to uh, toronto.ca. I guess uh, you can just, you know, honestly, just go toronto.ca and uh, do the do the, uh, the Google there, toronto.ca garden suites, and you'll be taken right to this link where you can provide your, your feedback. So what are some of the challenges of these garden suites right now for a lot of homeowners and uh, investors is the financing for the unit. You know, a lot of the folks that have been able to do garden suites, uh, not garden suites, but uh, laneway houses, um, you know, in Toronto, a lot of them have been able to access the, uh, the equity in their properties to be able to build these. So um, that might be challenging for a lot of folks to be able to build these uh, right up front. Um, but I think that that's coming when the institutions recognize, or, you know, maybe not the A-lenders, but a lot of the credit unions, um, you know, and, and uh, alternative lenders see that, you know, these are very beneficial um, in all the markets where they have, uh, you know, proliferated, you know, in the, especially in the West Coast, they make a lot of sense and they're, you know, they're renting out uh, for a very high amount um, and, you um, definitely financially makes sense. So once they come on board, I think that there is going to be financing, financing options for the construction. I am speaking to a few right now. Um, the appraised value is going to be tricky. Uh, there are some that have sold, so that provides a little bit of data. And I think uh, some lenders are going to maybe come, come at it as a three unit property, like a triplex. So, you know, because there isn't a lot out there in the market and most appraisers are still using the sales comparison approach in most cases, then uh, it's, it's, you know, that's gonna be a challenge, right? And of course, Daniel mentioned this, is not able to sever the property. So really it's one title. Now in, uh, in Vancouver and Victoria, they, they actually um, have uh, systems where they uh, condoize it, right? So they are able to sever the property. That may be something that's gonna be coming to Ontario in the future, who knows? Um, one alternative to this is, and this is something that some people have done, is that they, even though they're not able to sever it from a title perspective, they've been able to set up a uh, separate legal or sort of effectively a joint venture where they have a portion of the property. And I've spoken to a lawyer where something like this is very common in the UK, where you may have uh, multiple uh, units on a single property. And even though it's on one single title, they have legal structures to uh, create ownership so that that allows certain people to be able to access home ownership without necessarily having to own the entire property, right? So I think that that is an area that is uh, potentially there, there may be some uh, potential there, uh, some promise there for, for being able to kind of, you know, provide ownership to, to people who can't, you know, access an entire property. Okay, so very interesting things that are happening. So some of the advantages for a three unit 
house or three unit property with a main house, secondary suite and a garden suite, right? Any house that you buy right now, nobody's saying that you are, uh, you know, it's, it's perfect for building that garden suite, right? It's not priced into the market. So the, the fact that you folks are all here tonight, you're, you're basically the, um, you're really in the early adopting phase. And I think that this is going to be really popular in the next few years, up to the next 10 years. You know, this is what we saw with Second Suites. You know, Second Suites, um, it, it came into effect with uh, Bill 140 in 2011, 2012. And it wasn't until 2015 that we really saw it taking off. And of course, you know, there's a, a perfect storm of you know, high real estate prices, low interest rates, high immigration that really pushed that. But that's what we're seeing now. And I think that we're really early on. Um, I think a lot of you folks have the uh, the insider edge right now you can go out there look for the suitable properties to be able to build these and i think in five ten years uh, you're going to do very well with these uh, with these um, properties you're building on free land of course and then you get that potentially great cash flow so that's it for me um i am working on a guide right now and um you, get, you, you guys can all go to my website. Some of you, I think, probably already on there. Um, SweetEditions.com slash Garden Suites. Um, I will have this available, I would hope, in the next month or so. Um, most of the content is already written. I just kind of got to uh, make it a little bit prettier and also um, put in a little bit of new data based on some really rapidly changing policies. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Hopefully I was on time there. You were amazing. You guys were just phenomenal. Like I didn't have to like message you and flag you. You guys were amazing. Um, thank you so much, Andy. That was, that was great. I mean, between the two of you, your presentations worked so well together. That was amazing. Uh, we do have a ton of questions. So Andy, if you don't mind, are you okay to stop your yes, screen absolutely. share? And uh, we'll take a look at uh, some of the questions here that people have asked. So uh, Anita has the first question here. She, so she said, what if the garage is attached to the neighbor's garage? How do I know if my laneway is public? I was told it's city owned, but part leads to a private lot uh, owned by the church. So Daniel, this, these are the questions that sort of came in when you were doing your presentation initially. So um, Daniel, do you want to take this question or Andy? Sure. Yeah, I can. I take the second part. Maybe Andy, you want to do the first part. Um, the how do you know if it's a public lane? Uh, the city has a, a database and a map form that shows the status of all roadways. Um, remember how you get? We have it. <laughs> it's publicly available information. Uh, if you want to uh, shoot an email, you can book a. We do like a 15, 20 minute consult online, and I can take a look at that kind of thing for people on that and look up in the map and tell you the situation of it, whether it's public or private. Um, awesome. Doing a semi-detached, have you done those, Andy? Uh, two, two to stuck together? Um, for a garage? Yeah. I have not. No, we, we haven't done it for a laneway suite yet either. In theory, it's possible. Um, we know of a project where it's going ahead. There's some colleagues are working on that. Obviously, you know, if you want to build two at the same time, you need your neighbor's buy-in. If you're just building your half, like any semi-detached building, you are allowed to build and replace your half, but you have to leave their side standing somehow. So sometimes that means stepping back slightly from the property line to support their wall or working out a structurally sound way to keep their garage up while you build beside it. Awesome. Okay, good to know. Um, Nav was asking, what is the cost per square foot? Obviously, there's a lot of factors involved, but can you guys give, I mean, you guys have talked about some pricing sort of overall, like Daniel, for example, for your, you know, um, two bedroom one that you showed the the cottage one, what would we ballpark idea well, on that? Square foot, I gotta say, is a horrible, horrible way to price something like this, because <laughs> as Andy said at the beginning, you've got the same price for your electrical service, yeah, for your sewer line for your architect, for your permits, for all of these things. So your first square foot costs you, you know, thousands. <laughs> that first square foot costs you $50,000. Yeah. You know, and the last square foot costs you $50. So we found a 1,600 square foot, three bedroom building, slab on grade, while we have to do some complicated grade beams and helical piles because of grade change, 
That one was costing about $300 a square foot when it was done. In other words, it's slightly under $500,000. Mm -hmm. One that's half its size cost about 400,000. So about $450 a yeah. square foot. So that's why I say you can't, it's the smaller you go, the more, the higher the square foot price goes. It's not a terribly effective measure, but the response is, as Andy pointed out about what Hamilton was doing, it's, it's like, if you're going to do this, go big, go as you know, find the property that you can build the maximum that you're allowed on. That's where the sweet spot will be. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I wrote a, a blog post on this for our infill development side, because people ask us that all the time, right? That's the first question. And it is, you know, I agree with Daniel. It's, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a very loaded question, right? So sometimes we'll tell them it's 150 to two, two $500 a square foot, right? That's not very helpful. Right. And, uh, so, you know, I follow up with, you know, there's about eight questions that we have, right? Are you hiring a builder? Or are you the builder? What's the size of the property? How many units? What's your relationship with the trades? What are materials and labor costs? What's the quality of the build? What season are you building in? Are you just concerned about hard costs, i.e. cost of materials and labor of construction? Mm -hmm. Are you considering soft costs before construction? So, Yes, it's a, it's a very challenging question. Andy, well, what would you say is the spread between hard cost and like a hard, like how much do soft costs add to a build in your experience? Sort of percentage. Um, so when I say hard cost, I mean uh, basically labor and materials strictly. Um, starting at site service, site servicing is usually what I would determine. And then the soft cost would, would be um, all the stuff I mentioned to get that uh, site ready, right? Um, you know, starting with consent application and severance and, um, you know, planners, surveyors, application fees, architect, parkland dedication fee, demolition, all that stuff. That I consider that soft cost. Yeah. Do you have a, a rule of thumb or percentage number for how much oh, that's going to add? Um, depends on the market. So in some of the markets that I've mentioned in, in my presentation in the smaller cities, um, it's kind of like in the 20 to 40 percent range um, is the land cost, quote unquote. What, whereas in Toronto, we're probably approaching the 50 percent or higher, right? I don't know if that's kind of in line with your. Yeah, I would have said 35 to 40 percent is sort of what I warn people that the difference between hard cost and project cost, because it's an easy mistake to make. You think I'm building at whatever the you know the price of paying the builder to build the house, but that's not your total cost. Yes. Yeah. And this is why a lot of people need to be careful about back of the envelope uh, calculations from the realtor on development. Um, you need to really know the cost. And it sounds like you guys are awesome options for people to come to if they decide they want to go. Like for me, I have a, my mom has a house in Scarborough and I'm thinking about this and I know there's going to come a point in time where she's going to want to sell. She won't want to look after it anymore, but I'm thinking, you know, if for a fraction of, of, what it would cost to build it new if we could add a basement apartment and put something out back then now we're generating a cash flow and an income for my mom and she can go live wherever she wants without having to sell so i mean there's just th this is such a tremendous opportunity for for so many people that's fantastic thanks guys um quick qu question how long does it take to get approvals on average like how long should we, if we're, if we're building one of these guys, like how, yeah. I, are we a year from start to finish? Is it a year for permits and permission and then a year to complete it? What kind of timelines? I'm chuckling because I think the answer is like Andy's comment about 150 to 500 per square foot. It depends. Um, yeah. The big question for us is, are we going to committee of adjustment? In, in, and then which neighborhood, if you're in Toronto, it matters which neighborhood you live in. Committee of adjustment in Etobicoke is much faster than in East York. I don't know why, but it is. So committee can add six months easily to an approval process. I generally tell people, if you're not going to committee, allow six months from the time you first call us to the time we might be able to get you a building permit. You know, that allows for design time, lining things up, and then you've got to do In today's market, though, the critical, the key factor really for our projects is lining up the builder. And so most of the builders we work with are booked up for 2021. So they're looking at their booking spring of 2022. Yeah, which gives you lots of time to arrange your financing anyways. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. so assuming uh, you're able to build your garden suite by right um, without having to go through the committee, then it's, you know, a standard, it's almost a standard building permit, right? So the, you know, they're required to, they're required to, but, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, is to get back to you uh, within the 15-day uh, period uh, from the submission time. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's always... 
there's always going to be back and forth with the with the plans examination department um, and various other things. So, you know, I would say for the building permit process for building a garden suite, uh, you know, I would I would budget from the time of submission to the time of approvals, assuming it is everything is by right. Um, you know, uh, six to eight weeks. Yeah. And then for actual construction, again, it will vary, but we are seeing around six months for laneway suites. Um, there's some very interesting developments going on in the area of prefabrication, particularly panelized systems that can cut time off. And, and we've done some diving into full modular, uh, which has the potential to cut a lot of time off the process. But it's um, if you want really good quality and you want green, it's still not quite ready for prime time. Very close. <laughs> But I think you're going to see a lot of this for the single story garden suite. I think we will see a lot of modular options, things like uh, what Royal Homes does and companies like that, that are basically sort of building to building code, not necessarily you know, a big step above that, but they do it and they do uh, some standardized designs and they do it very quickly. Okay. So I think that's an area of interest to look into. There's a, there's a couple of questions here about heating. You know, how are you, so did I catch earlier, Andy, you were saying that you believe that these garden suites should be electric heat? Is it, or are you recommending like a little boiler, a little furnace out there? Yeah, what I, I think that uh, for a smaller, you know, I think both of us agree that uh, having electric heating is a, is a good option, right? So some of these are going to, you know, they're going to be very well insulated um, anyways, smaller units, uh, you're going to build them very airtight. And, you know, a lot of these systems these days are very efficient. So you can have heat pumps or, you know, uh, electric combination boilers that might be able to handle both your, your heating needs and your domestic hot water needs. And uh, it just makes sense to not have to bring in a gas line if possible. Um, it really depends on the size and how you're building it. Uh, it's something that I think most people should start thinking about, uh, even, even if it's not going to be on their first property is to think about the, the mandates for, uh, you know, going net zero by 2030, which is you know, the, the, the building code mandate. And that's about getting off of fossil fuels. So we're not leaving the carbon footprint. And when we say go electric, we mean, as Andy said, heat pumps. They're called air source heat pumps. It's, your fridge is a heat pump. An air conditioner is a heat pump. They are three to four times more energy efficient than a baseboard heater. So not, a, not old style baseboards. But the other comment is about the size. If you go into the market, you're not gonna find a gas furnace that's sized for a 700 square foot house. We just don't make them small enough. They don't modulate down. So they're oversized, they short cycle, they're uncomfortable and horribly inefficient at that scale. They're built for the mainstream suburban 2000, 3000 square foot marketplace. So whereas electric units can be really right sized and very small and the heat pumps can give you heating and cooling out of one unit. So you're not paying for a separate air conditioning unit. So we're fine. They're definitely the way and the loads in a small airtight, well insulated building are so small. You really don't need a lot of energy to heat and cool them. That's so cool. Just to see, you know, the direction of where building is heading, you know, in the next five, 10, 15 years to see what's, what's going to be happening, especially in high, in areas like Toronto, where, you know, we've, we feel like we've built so much in, in the area. And the question is, where do you go from here? But to have this as an option is, is phenomenal. And it really makes it, you know, more accessible for more people to live in Toronto, but also more affordable for people to buy in Toronto again, you know, a couple of thousand dollars a month in income is, is really worth it. Fantastic. You guys, it's been such a pleasure to have both of you here. So for those of you who are attending, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. Hopefully we've addressed most of your questions. Both of the guys, super friendly and approachable. So I'm just going to bring up uh, contact information for them in just a second here. As always, at the end of one of my webinars, we are going to do a draw for the Action Takers Real Estate Investing Planner. It's an autographed copy. My, uh, my friend Quentin has signed it for you. So let's see, there, are, there were 50 people at one point in the webinar. So uh, Andy, pick a number between 1 and 50 and my amazing VA Mary Beth will find entrant number 50, number whatever number you pick and they will be contacted by Mary Beth to arrange shipping for their book. So a number between 1 and 50. All right, let's go with 39. 
39, there we go. Mary Beth, that'll be up to you to figure out entrant number 39 to the webinar. We'll be contacting you tomorrow to find out where to ship. Here is the contact information for everybody in the webinar tonight, myself, of course, and Danielle and Andy. And as Danielle had mentioned, stay uh, tuned. There will be a uh, email sent out with a recording of the webinar so you can go back and check any information if you want or feel free to share it with friends. And we will also be including Danielle's information package on, um, on garden suites and laneway housing and all that cool stuff so that you'll be able to access that as well. Uh, let me just check the chat box here. Oh, amazing session. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. It was such a pleasure to have all of you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned. Our next webinar coming up is in June. Nope, the end of May. Nope, June. nope, the end of May. The end of May, my apologies. The 26th. It's going to be with Mike and Mark. We're going to be talking about buying commercial buildings, all the things they wish they knew when they were starting out, where to find them, how to run the numbers, all that cool stuff. So it'll be uh, May the 26th at 7 o'clock p.m. And uh, stay tuned. Your thank you email that will come out following will also have a link so you can get a, a spot and register right away. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Special thank you to you guys, Andy and Danielle. It's been such a pleasure. You guys are a wealth of information, and I definitely know who I'm going to talk to when I convince my mom that she needs a coach house in her backyard. <laughs> awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Thank Danielle. Thank you so much, guys. Thank Take you care, everyone. Good to see All you, the Andy. best. Happy investing, everyone. Yeah. Take care.